Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Lovely full room. It's so nice to see everybody. Empty front row, as ever. <laughs> anyway, welcome to this session on the future of artificial perception, subtitled, What Can Computers Learn From Humans? And I'd just like to very briefly introduce our panelists. We have Danica Krajic from KTH in Stockholm. We have a very rare phenomenon of a husband and wife Nobel laureate team, Edvard and Maybrit Moser, 2014 Nobel laureates in medicine. And we have Maggie Bowden from the University of Sussex, who you met this morning as well. So this morning, the question, one question came up in one panel, which was, um, will AI be an evolution of human intelligence? And I guess that sort of also would be a subtitle for our panel, because what we're going to ask is how much our knowledge of human perception and, by extension, human intelligence will extend to the way we develop intelligent computers. Um, and I think we ought to begin by thinking about how much we know about human intelligence, human perception. So who would like to describe our current state of understanding of the biology of human oh. perception. <laughs> to give a lecture, you to mean? Give, no, to, in, in one minute. <laughs> oh, <whoa>. Not me. <laughs> Edward, Maggie? I can start and you can do the second minute. But the uh, <laughs> first thing is that, uh, as we discussed this morning, intelligence is a very, very broad concept. But uh, each of the sub-functions of, uh, of intelligence, uh, which we often call cognition, uh, I mean planning, or thinking, or memory, or learning, or imagination. Uh, I mean, we are beginning to understand how these things work in the brain. And uh, uh, so it's very different from when we started uh, in the field of uh, neuroscience some uh, more 20, almost 30 years ago. Then actually. it was simple, then yeah. it was just a black box. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but now it's not a black box anymore. And I think we are starting to see how neurons, big groups of neurons, thousands of neurons can actually collaborate to generate these phenomena. But at the same time, I think it's important to say that we are just at the beginning and uh, it's very, very complicated. But you wanted to hear about perception, not intelligence, or both? Well, since we've started with intelligence, we can come back to perception, but mm -hmm. Ray Kurzweil this morning presented an idea of how, of one model of how the brain might work. What, can I get your quick reaction to that? Uh, well, I mean, I, uh, actually, I was out for an interview during that session. <laughs> oh, so that so I no, can't. I can't, is the right. answer. Lucky. <laughs> Lucky one. Yeah. No. Were you there, Marbury? Uh, the green room was so noiseless, I didn't oh. hear okay. it. Okay, <laughs> never mind. A missed opportunity. We'll come back to that one no, another time. But, but, but it's important to define uh, intellectual uh, abilities, because w what, what is it? And... Um, uh, IQ tests for Edward and me being psychologists, that was almost a bad word because uh, it's so culturally dependent the way we were taught uh, to think about uh, intelligence because it was measured by tests mm. that uh, uh, were not, um, uh, they, they were really biased. But of course, intelligence is about survival and it's also about emotional intelligence. And I think emotional intelligence is what makes us human. Hmm. And, pr and, and on, on, the, uh, in the, on the question of understanding what that is, we're hmm. really nowhere, I, I assume. I mean, we understand, so you, from, your, from work from you and from others, we understand something about how we perceive space. I, I think we are, uh, I mean, um, space is just an example of the fact that we're beginning to understand some of the, what we believe are the basic algorithms of the brain or, or of the cortex. Uh, and uh, I think one of the reasons why we are studying space is that we're not only interested in space as such, but because it's a, a window into areas of the cortex that we know much, much less. But it still tells us something about these algorithms. And those are the algorithms that probably are of interest to artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. Not exactly how neurons do, what, what are the rules that the brain uses? Mm. But when you hear that people are trying to develop artificially intelligent systems based on our knowledge of how the brain works, do you think our knowledge of the, how the brain works is sufficient? 
for them to be working on that already? How, how, how do you think that the connection is there yet? I, I noticed uh, this morning when, the, yeah. when these questions came up, there was a sort of silence about the connection between biology and AI. So. But I, could, could I yeah, say, no, okay. sorry. <laughs> no, it's just about how did our brain develop? It was not only to produce intelligence. But a computer, if you develop a computer, you want to have an intelligent robot or whatever you want, an intelligent machine. So our brain contains so much more than intelligence. So to learn from the brain and just copy it, maybe it's not useful. So artificial intelligence can, machines can be so intelligent without using what we know from the brain. Mm. Yes. I think that uh, uh, it, it's probably very useful uh, we have to confirm that, but it's very useful to know about the algorithms or the ways that the brain mm. does it, and may it serve as a really useful guideline. And I guess that's what's happening partly now in AI, that actually uh, the mechanism that the brain uses, uh, or is believed to use, is actually used by computers. But of course, computers are very different, so um, I mean, it has to be done, in, but the principles still can be transferred, mm. can't they? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there are very many um, um, different, re different reasons uh, why um, and uh, why studies in, in humans or in general in biological systems are relevant for artificial systems. The first one is to, of course, understand the principles or the processes of how things or information is, is processed in the brain, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we can draw a parallel with birds and airplanes. Uh, Aeroplanes do not fly as birds, but are basically built on the technology of understanding how uh, uh, birds fly, mm -hmm. okay? But it's not as effective or not as optimal to build artificial systems that fly as birds. So if you draw that parallel, so understanding the brain and the processes in brain can tell us something about how information is processed in order to build or be inspired uh, for, for building artificial systems, but not copy it necessarily. Mm. Okay, so that's one thing. The other aspect is the structural, um, uh, the structural aspect, right? So um, what is the hardware and how does the hardware work? And that can also serve as inspiration for building sensory systems. Today, uh, we do have examples of like visual systems or cameras that work, for example, like the visual system in a fly or um, uh, works and so on. And it gives the possibility to systems to be devoted to specific um, uh, applications. So understanding why a fly or other biological system has developed the sensing or perceptual system can make similar, um, um, or we can draw parallels to that. But also the artificial systems for the future um, are there to help human in some way to interact with humans and so on. And in order to be able to do that, the machines also need to understand the human way of interaction with mm -hmm. the environment. Okay, so this is really, really important. Because if you want to have a robot that is a little bit more than a vacuum cleaner, a robot you talk to, a robot you can send to places, a robot that does not use only metric information, because humans do not really use lots of metric information, right? We have different types of topological maps and so on. We talk about relations. Uh, well, you will find a PR room in the hallway to the right. I mean, we use landmarks and so mm. on. And understanding of those processes and how we use natural language to actually convey the, the way we store the information and so on is also an inspiration of making machines that can be more human friendly in terms of interaction, that can make themselves understood by humans. But, ta but taking the analogy of birds and planes, uh, sure, when, when humans learned to fly, they copied some aspects of birds that weren't actually right to copy, and then they kind of gradually got closer to work, uh, working out how birds actually flew. But when we look at brains and intelligent computers, how, back to this first question of how much do you think we understand about the way that the brain processes space? And so how far along the road to understanding are we? And how much, and therefore how valuable it is, is it for people developing artificial systems to try and copy that? Or should they be waiting until we understand more? I think one should uh, try to copy it when one thinks one understands. I mean, it's a mutual dialogue, mm -hmm. but uh, I will also emphasize that uh, uh, the process of understanding the brain is much, much slower than the development of computer technology. So I, I think that is a challenge for 
AI that uh, that uh, it's I mean, going the progress too fast. the progress in our field <laughs> is not all that fast. I mean, there's a few little things. I mean, in terms of understanding principles, that's actually many of the principles uh, that guide our theories today were developed um, in the 60s, 70s, 80s. So. So we can talk about um, some of the ongoing projects also um, in Europe, where the um, the idea is if we can build artificial systems that perform at a human level on the data that humans use in their, their everyday life, and that to some extent also have the structure capabilities that that or the structure that that maybe human brain uh, has, that we can also do in a way reverse engineering. So understand human way of acting. I'm, I'm just saying there are mm. lots of people that believe in that, that that's possible of doing. So building artificial systems mm. that give them better understanding of how human brain works. Thanks. Thank you. Thank but you. the question is not just how do human brains work, mm. you know, which is hugely important and interesting in itself and may well turn out to be and has already to some extent been helpful in AI. That's not just the only question. The question is not just how is the information um, handled by the brain, but what information is it? In other words, psychological questions, which have to be answered in computational terms. And what sorts of computation, what sorts of information does our, mm. do our psychological studies tell us that the, that the brain is actually handling? And until you've got clear about those questions, you haven't got a chance of being clear about how, the, even knowing how to ask you know, where to look, how, how the brain does it. And I think that's very often forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, in this case, for example, uh, I mean, when people talk about, uh, um, you know, huge advances that there have been in machine perception, vision, for example, and they give examples like, you know, now recognizing a cat's face from a dog, you know, discriminating cat and a dog and using big data and machine learning and all of that. Yes, yes, yes. But, of course, this is something that we can do um, and which previous AI systems couldn't do. So that's all fine. But human vision isn't just for, for recognising things. Mm. It's also for, you know, giving what the psychologist Gibson called affordances, you know, recognising what possibilities for action, what opportunities do this particular spatially, you know, spatial phenomenon offer? And that's hugely important. Um, and there's none of that in all of this, you know, cat's face recognizer stuff at all. So that's hugely important. And, and also, I mean, when we look at something, um, very often, arguably always, certainly very, very often, we have all sorts of other things going on not just in our heads, but I would say, you know, in our vision, if you like, um, than just recognizing something. We see an analogy. It may be, a, you know, a spatial analogy to something else, or perhaps to a painting that we saw once, and or perhaps to a mythical figure, a painting that's important because of the mythological story that it's telling, blah, 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 blah. Now, all of this, it seems to me, it is part of vision, you could say, well, it's not vision, it's thinking, which is triggered by vision. You could put it that way. But anyway, it seems to me it's very, very closely linked. And until we get machines, that c visual machines, you know, that can do that, mm. uh, we can't claim that they've approached human vision. And again, as far as I know, there's no work on, on that. Mm. Mm. I can, I can. Um, so the, the affordances you're talking about, or as, as, as people have called it and tried with functional categories, it's actually a very, very difficult task. And very often I ask people, okay, um, our job is about writing uh, computer programs that take video sequences and try to understand them. So building really complicated models uh, based on many examples. But um, a very simple question, what is a chair, okay? Uh, and then, you know, people look at me, okay, it's not a tricky question, okay, what's a chair? And then 99% of people will answer something I can sit on. And then I say, okay, I can sit on the floor, I can sit on a table, what's not a chair? So for a computer program, they're not so very um, uh, good in understanding what's not a specific category, right? And how to find the differences between something that, that has a function and that does not have a function. 
um, um, I have a one and a half year old at home that, and her brain obviously understood the shape, but not the function yet. <laughs> and it's really interesting to see because I would have never, never, I think, um, 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 noticed that. So, so she has a chair for her doll, okay, that she's trying to sit on. Mm -hmm. And the chair is approximately this size. <laughs> and it's a fantastic video that I use in my lectures now because she has the shape information in her brain, but not yet the function. Mm. So I asked her, so Isabel, what are you trying to do? Sit, sit, sit. And you know, she, she, she's just trying and falling down all the time. And it's really interesting. This is exactly how, how um, for the future, that's going to be a problem for, for computer systems um, in general, to understand what's not a good example. Mm. Yeah, I, I think what you are talking about is often what we in neuroscience call top-down processes because even the simplest thing like just uh, seeing or recognizing visual image is actually influenced by everything else that uh, the brain knows and everything else that happens simultaneously in the brain has to go back. And that's why mm -hmm. we uh, humans or other animals are so good at distinguishing a chair from a non-chair, which mm -hmm. is so difficult for a computer. And then I think that's one thing more we can do, which animals and humans do, is that not only can you distinguish, but you actually know, uh, you know a lot about probabilities, which you can then use to guide behavior. So for example, when you run through a, a, a big, uh, lots of people on the street, you manage to navigate your way because you know how likely it is that he or she walks left or right and bumps into you. Uh, so you can use all of this information together with all the input that comes in at the same time just to interpret this little image. Mm -hmm. and that's a um, immense yeah. task. And yeah, also cryo. visual illusions. I don't yeah, know how yeah. robots can do that. No, that's, that's e exactly so. I think that very many times I, we forget that our visual or perception systems in general are not mm you know, 100%, so to speak, mm -hmm. because we do fail a lot. But the thing is that they have developed so that we can actually um, uh, manage in the world uh, around us. But lots of intelligence is also in the body. So it's not about only mm -hmm. how we see and perceive images, it's also what and how uh, the, the, the things and the objects in the environment can be used by our bodies. And what I usually say when you talk about the analogy, if I'm to flip a pancake, it's more likely to use a knife, right? If I don't have a spatula, than a spoon, mm -hmm. but if I mix a soup and I don't have something to stir with, I will more likely use a spoon than a knife. And that's basically, you know, the, 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 the yeah. heart of the functional yeah. categories. We are able to generalize. We use uh, uh, lots of experiences that, you know, we have used those things. We know what those functions are. And that's what machines are still not good in. Well, doing. from where I'm sitting, it sounds like a fairly insurmountable task to bring all that to bear on a machine. But we'll <laughs> come back to that. I really want to involve the audience in this discussion yeah. as well. So we have some circulating microphones, I believe. Yes, they're all at the back at the moment, but they'll come forward. If, would anybody like to make a comment or question about the, what we're talking about at the moment? Feel free if you do. Can I, can I com you can comment speak. when yes. we are waiting for the audience? No, because there was, uh, when, when our children were young, they had to read these novels, and uh, one was so fascinating. It was about uh, this uh, robot that should help a person to get up from the bed, go to the bathroom, eat, and all the time. And, and, and one morning, he took this person out of the bed, put him in the chair, but something was wrong because the person didn't eat. And then he put him on the train so that he could go to work. But something was wrong. But the robot couldn't detect what was wrong. The person was dead. <laughs> <laughs> How could a machine know? Okay. It's an it's awful story, example. and that's probably why I remember it. But, <laughs> but it just tells the difference, as you say. What is the difference between a human being and a computer? A computer hasn't experienced to give food to a dead person before and didn't have that in the program. Absolutely, but um, th there is also another important point, I think, and that, that is that humans learn, and then we forget certain things, okay? like mathematics, maybe that we have learned like 20, 30 years ago, we don't mm. necessarily know it as, as we knew it um, at some point. But from machines, we expect that they learn and remember 
everything. Okay, and that's also going to be one of the problems because the models <laughs> that we need to use, you know, um, become much more complex. And at some point, not necessarily, we can, uh, even if we would know how human brain uh, works, given that we don't have this forgetting factor yeah, in the machines. But that's so may affect important it. because yeah. there are these people who can't forget. Yeah. They have this superior autobiographical memory. And but it affects other. It affects other parts yeah, of their behavior. But they can't. Yeah. They can't even forgive. Yeah. Hmm. And that's and that's a big problem. That's uh, exactly. That machines don't. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Please. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask the neuroscientists on the panel about the brain. Uh, we know that robots have algorithmic brains. What about human uh, brains? Do they work on algorithms or or something else? What's your take on that? We found a grid cell and it looks like a mathematical function. It's uh, equilateral triangles, like in my bag that I got from the designer <laughs> who made my, my dress. So there is, of course, mathematics in the brain, but it's not so simple because there are all kinds of functions. Wouldn't but you say I that? think, uh, um, I mean, the human brain is, is not very different at the algorithmic level from uh, a rat brain or a mouse brain or even an insect brain. I mean, the basic rules are, are the same all the way. It's just like DNA. DNA works, DNA works the same way in a human being as mm -hmm. in a yeast cell. So it's, uh, I, I think the basic rules are the same. And uh, uh, since we know it's so, so similar in, let's say, a mouse mm -hmm. or in a rat or in a bat or in a monkey, uh, then, although we know much less about the human brain, it's extremely unlikely that humans would have developed on a different path. Mm. But, but can I just add, sorry? You, you, you didn't say so much, so please. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that uh, Maybrit's example of the, the story about the dead person mm. and the robot reminds me of a, a, a very, very interesting case. I'm trying to remember the name of the book or the author in which I read it years ago, and I can't, but I remember the example very, very well. well. Uh, this person was a psychologist. She was teaching a course in psychology to medical students who were already in their clinical training. So they were working in the hospital and uh, various parts of the hospital already. And she showed them a photograph um, of a baby, uh, I don't know, just a few months old, um, sitting up against a brick wall with a white uh, sort of dress thing on. And she said, you know, what's wrong with this baby? Or you know, how would you diagnose this baby? And it went on and on and on and on, and they discussed and they discussed and discussed. And while they were discussing, one person said, well, it's a very well cared for baby, because look at that spotless white nightdress that she's in. And another one said, well, Yes, but I mean, it's not very kind to put a baby up against the brick wall. So they, they were worrying about this. Anyway, to cut a long story short it, t short, it turned out that the baby was a dead baby who was in the hospital morgue, which the students, being already clinical students, had visited, had seen, and they had picked up the fact of that brick wall. They'd fixed picked up the, what they called the nightdress, which of course was the hospital uh, shroud. Um, but because they just expected to be looking at living children in order to try and help them in some way by diagnosing what was wrong with them in the first place, uh, it just never occurred to them that it could be a dead baby. She had to point it out. The top down yes, very the much so. And they were, mm. But they were giving, being given apparently you know, a sort of purely visual test. You may look at this baby and see, you know, look for symptoms of illness and which symptoms do you find? Well, they didn't find any. If we want to talk mathematically about things, then, then um, we talk about priors or prior information that uh, somehow um, um, it affects the model or decision model or the expert system. 
And I think that um, um, having this prior uh, information, so have I been in this situation before, or how other people have done or performed in a situation like this before, affects a lot of our performance and our behavior on a daily basis. And today, when we build computer systems, we put lots of prior information in it. So if we talk about so-called supervised learning, we put labels on images and so on. But the problem is that lots of this prior information makes sense because we have the body we have, we do the mm. things we do. And in the future, robots may have very different body than the human has. And the priors that make sense to us may not have any effect or, or, or let's say, even good effect on their uh, robots' learning capabilities. And that's an important issue also to discuss. Yeah, because where the priors come we, we've set up this panel to investigate what computers can learn from humans, and we've established very much that there's all sorts of human-animal behaviours that will be extremely difficult to replicate in computers because there is so much mm, associated. Yeah. Yeah. But presumably, uh, and the pace, of, the pace of discovery in biology is going to be too slow to really inform this rapid development of computers to a major extent. So maybe maybe computers are going to, in fact, not learn all that much except for this basic paradigm of needing to be have, ha, have multiple inputs to understand anything and then go their own way. What do you feel? Absolutely. But even for humans, learning certain things takes a really long time. So one should not forget about that. And even things we learn, we do sometimes change the way we think about things or the way we do things, you know, if we, if we see, if from the beginning we learn to do something and then we see somebody doing uh, something in a more effective or optimal way, we, we have a tendency of adopting that, that way of doing things and so on. So I think that, that uh, it, it is really, really important to understand biological systems. Uh, and I think in terms of perception, we have a good understanding, for example, of how the eye work, uh, works uh, precisely. We, we do have an understanding of where the information is processed in the brain when it comes to visual information, when it comes to uh, motor information. We also know a lot about that there is lots of interaction with these two areas because we look and we do things and so on. So that, that definitely serves as a good inspiration for building. I'd systems. like to invite more questions, but what, what, what's your feeling about the Blue Brain Project and these, these, these <laughs> efforts to understand, to map the entire connect, connector? Can we talk about something different? <laughs> 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 but there's something that is so exciting, because we know that the brain is so important for perception, like you say. And still, I find it so surprising when you see a rat eating sugar or chocolate, and if you stimulate the sense or, or bitterness in the brain and the mouse or the rat is then oh and you know it's sugar but of course you stimulated the site that is re recording uh, bitterness so uh, again it's the brain <laughs> is important i can say <laughs> something about the blue brain project i think my uh, personal view is that it's far too early to simulate uh, an entire mm. brain, or even just a little part of the brain. Uh, but nonetheless, simulation as such, I think, is very important. But uh, um, the way I think simulation, or computational neuroscience, as we call it, works best is when you, you have an idea, an, a model, a hypothesis, and then you try to figure out how could this be solved by a certain group of neurons. Mm. Um, my impression of uh, much of the work in the Blue Brain uh, project is that it's driven from uh, a different way of approaching science, which may also be valid, but is more bottom-up, uh, mm. where you sort of collect data and see how they fit together, maybe something pops up. So there are different traditions. Uh, I think my starting point, and, and my brains of course too, is that uh, I think Still, what drives science is having hypotheses and then test them out. And also, if, if you understand how a computer works, you don't know what you get out if you change the input. And that's the same with, with the brain. So it depends on how the brain is wired, what kind of information you have. It's like people, when they talk about cloning, you can't clone a person whatsoever because a person is not only genes, a person is also experience. 
So and, and, and the blue brain, yes, they have this tiny part that they can uh, probably describe, and that's important to, to know small parts, but to explain the whole brain, not possible at all. Maybe I would think. Also relates to... Did you want to comment, maybe? I agree. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, que had a question here. Um, she was first. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I apologize. Oh, Please. that's okay. Uh, I was wondering, how do we prevent like the self-learning machine from picking up the worst of our habits or behaviors? Like, What type of implementation should we have to stop them from learning the things we don't want them to learn from humans? Um, there have been um, a discussion in panels before um, lunch also about um, the danger of, of self-learning machines and not knowing what, what um, it is and so on. I'm a strong believer in that when we develop machines uh, that, that are able to think and uh, self-develop in some way, that they should also have teachers as humans have, okay? And something that we have is both um, understanding of ethics and moral. And that's something that we don't discuss enough. How do we make sure that the rules uh, that are used to uh, guide the learning process are also um, uh, com you know, conveying or the ethics and moral, and also having some form of external teacher that can say this is a good and this is a bad um, um, uh, outcome of, of, of a learning session. And I think that um, there is a um, lots of um, discussion about that in several communities, computer vision, machine learning, and so on. Uh, we talk about supervised learning, we talk about semi-supervised learning, but there is also lots of discussion about uh, a completely unsupervised learning. So, so just having lots of data and then learning something. And that's very difficult. I think that the machines that learn without the teacher can, are very limited. I don't think that they, these machines can learn anything uh, on, on a pretty kind of like high level, making the generalizations and uh, understanding affordances. I don't think that that will come to the machines, mm -hmm. especially not to machines that are not embodied, okay? Mm -hmm. Because I think that lots of intelligence we have is in the, the way we interact with the environment, that that's mm -hmm. something that you said, the experiences that we gather throughout the life is also what we physically do uh, uh, with the body. So um, I think that, that um, having semi-supervised systems and using the teacher in the loop can uh, achieve that. And then, of course, having the rules that are based on ethics and moral. Please. Curiosity was, curiosity was mentioned earlier today as being a, a key part of intelligence, of human intelligence. And, and many learning systems learn what we ask them to learn. Uh, and this connects, of course, to what, to what Danica just said, that how uh, curiosity could be considered some kind of meta urge to sort of learn things that we don't know and, you know, to conquer new aesthetic domains or understand something that we don't even know what to do with. How do we, uh, I would like to hear your reflections on how, how do we actually implement this in machines? It connects to creativity, of course, it connects to aesthetic experiences, etc. And those are key elements of, of human intelligence. How do we deal with that? That's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, your curiosity, as you implied in, in, in your question, comes out of a knowledge that you don't know something. Um, an understanding, maybe only to a very, very limited degree, because you find that you can't do something which you wanted to do, and so obviously you don't know how to do it, so you need to find out. Sometimes, you know, much more um, wide and interesting than that, where you're thinking about a sort of interesting, complex area of human knowledge, for example. Um, and for a an AI system to realize, if you like, that it doesn't know something, when it isn't just a question of, you know, there is a particular measurement, for example, that it needs to know um, if it wants to lift this cup, you know, and it hasn't, it looks for the measurement, it hasn't got it, so the program could say, well, you know, go and find it, so, yeah. okay, no problem. <laughs> but if we're talking about the more interesting sorts of case, where we would talk about curiosity. 
uh, where, as I think you, you suggested, you aren't even necessarily uh, looking to solve a particular sort of problem. You're just interested. You don't know. And maybe you think maybe nobody else knows either. And um, that's especially interesting. So how can you find out? Now, the sort of meta-knowledge, if you like, the sort of self-knowledge that you need about your own intellectual competence and your own degree of learning is, um, you know, miles away, miles away from anything uh, that exists or even is being approached or um, attempted in AI today. I'm not saying it's in principle impossible. I don't think the human brain works by magic. And I don't think, therefore, that the human mind works by magic. And so I don't think it's in principle impossible. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it's, A, hugely difficult um, in some ways that we sort of begin to understand, in some ways that we don't, many ways that we don't yet understand, um, hugely difficult and would be hugely expensive and who would want to put the money in and as I think it was Barbara said this morning there are very other ways you know much cheaper you know bouquet of roses perhaps um, to make new human intelligence why, why pull the all money into human level AI intelligences I don't think it'll happen so very shortly Paula hi um, so um, in in the um, robotics community, people talk about um, um, encoding drives for, uh, like, you know, learning or dri driving the, the, the curiosity. But for me, when it comes to humans, you always um, uh, have the curiosity driving either the, 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 the lack of knowledge in something, right? Uh, or because uh, you have some artistic, let's say, you, you want to explore something and see what the result of that would be. And in principle, that wouldn't be difficult to program in machines, those type of drives. But... Um, what would one do with that? We see today robots make, making paintings, right? But we also have experiments showing that if a human uh, perceiver knows that it's painted by a robot, it has less value than if it's painted by a human. Okay, so what's the value for the main kind of a curious robot? That's an important thing uh, to think about. But also it's uh, in the mathematics we use to drive the curiosity. And that's that many of the mathematical models are today based on um, looking into correlations between data. So trying to find similarities, right? And there is this uh, very known book or experiment showing that you know, just looking into correlation curves or something like that, there are very many things in life that correlate, but the correlation itself does not really make any mm. sense. So uh, we need to be really, really careful in what kind of mathematical models are used to really drive the curiosity, but that also have a good values and think of what's the curiosity for. Mm. Question at the back, please. Yes, I can't see, but the, I, I'm having it pointed. Is there somebody here? No, okay, back there. Yeah, if there. we are talking about the human's perception, we intrinsically has, have a very high level of integration of different uh, channels of information. Vision, tactile information, uh, hearing. Uh, so what the state of art uh, to implement that on algorithmical way in machines or and also which ways we can see how we can achieve the progress in this area in machines that's a, lov it's a lovely summary question because we don't have very long so let's make that our last question very shortly please. since this is my area of research we can talk for 45 minutes after this <laughs> 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 Feel free. Um, uh, but the um, um, the 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 research has come pretty far in terms of um, uh, addressing or integrating different types of sensing modalities, as, as I usually say. Uh, when working with robots and artificial sensing, we also have um, to work with sensing that humans don't have, such as, for example, the ability to measure distance. Humans cannot do that, not in metric coordinates, right? But we can put a laser or a sonar on a robot and get the metric information out directly. So not, it's not so much in terms of integrating the sensory information, it's about representing it. So how do we use the sensory knowledge and how do we make sure, how do we assess that the right sensor or sensors are used for the right task? So for mm -hmm. example, lifting a cup from the table 
is not necessarily that I need to visually guide my arm, you know, in order to pick it up. It's already in my map. You two can say more about that. But I basically can use or will rely much more on my tactile mm. sensing, right, if I want to mm. kind of be polite and look at you while I'm doing that. So I think that uh, the, the, the modeling, the way of integrating sensing, uh, sensory information uh, has still a lot, lot to learn. Mm. But there is one... Uh, one additional question probably related to this, which is that, at least in, in humans, uh, we're bombarded by inputs all the time, and it could be the same in a robot Sorry. too, but then you have to select what is relevant yes. and what is not relevant, and that's, mm. I imagine, that's a very challenging it's, task. It's very difficult, that's yeah. exactly what yeah. I say, you need yeah. to find the right sensing yeah. Yeah. For, the, for the task. Yeah. Yeah. Any closing thoughts about the hope of um, having uh, artificial systems that can perceive the world in a useful in a useful way. Well, there are already lots of them, but they only work on on very narrow uh, examples. I mean, for instance, if you want a, a an AI system that will recognise a particular sort of cancer cell uh, just as reliably, in fact, in some cases, much more reliably mm. than a highly paid human uh, specialist pathologists, they already exist. Yeah. So, you know, there are already useful perceptual systems. I'm sure there will be lots more, but sure, that's but, not what we've been talking no, about. No, exactly, but extending into the future. Well, but um, maybe uh, a little bit on the side, but I can imagine that uh, you can have uh, interactions between AI and biological systems such as artificial vision and, and also cochlear implants, where I think the difference is that the nerve system, the brain, has to learn how to interpret the signals. Mm -hmm. But that, I can imagine, can happen, and that's not so far maybe into the future. Mm -hmm. I think that, just a small example, I say that there is currently no robot in the world that can do dishes. Okay? <laughs> it's a very complex task. Or, for example, being able to cut any loaf of bread of any kind of like thing. So there, there are challenges in terms of equipping artificial systems with the capabilities that humans do almost without any mental mm. <laughs> difficulty. And uh, I, I think it's a um, it's bright future in terms of understanding how some of the perceptual systems in human, um, in human work in order to understand what would be kind of like the challenges for the technical systems, you know, to, to go further and then do dishes at some point. Okay. And as a last thought, is the speed of progress, is the rate of progress in neuroscience going to speed up? Yes. Neuroscience is going to speed up? I think yes. it is speeding up. Good. Yeah, it has <laughs> been speeding up so much. As I said, we as students, we learned about the brain as a black box. And now we know so much. Okay, nice hopeful messages. Thank you mm -hmm. very much indeed, all panellists. Thank, Thank you, you the audience.